As you can see from the title slide here, uh, first of all, my name is Greg Flato. I'm a research scientist with Environment and Climate Change Canada. I'm also uh, a member of the Bureau of the IPCC. Uh, the presentation that I'll give today is is based on primarily on this report, whose cover page you see on the slide there, called Canada's Changing Climate Report. This was completed last year. It serves as a summary of climate change information, up-to-date uh, information for Canada. It covers both observations, how climate has changed in the past and what we have observed in Canada in terms of a changing climate, and projections of future change. And the link that's shown there uh, gives you a link to the online version of that report, so you're, you can, it's open to the public. I also have a few slides that are directly from uh, the IPCC Special Report on 1.5 that was mentioned uh, earlier. That will be coming up towards the end. But I should also point out that much of the material that's in this Canada's Changing Climate Report is based on previous IPCC assessment reports, so it's been through several rounds of review, as has this report itself. All right, if we go to the next slide, so it should be slide two. Uh, I have two slides here that I wanted to just use to, to set up the, the big picture, and then we'll start to zoom in on Canada. So this figure, uh, which was just released uh, a couple of weeks ago, is an updated version of a plot that shows the global annual mean change in surface air temperature from five different uh, observationally based data sets. Um, and so it covers the period 1850 to basically the present, the end of, of 2019. The different colored curves show the results from these different observational data sets. Uh, and the thing that you see, first of all, is that the different observational data sets agree one with another. Uh, they all show both interannual variability, uh, that is the change from year to year that jiggles up and down, that's part of natural climate variability, and they show this overall increase in temperature, which is the warming that is attributable to human-caused forcing, primarily the emission of greenhouse gases, also land use change, and that that has led to roughly a one degree increase in global mean temperature since the pre-industrial period, so in the, the middle 1800s. So that's, that's the big picture. The climate is, is warming. Uh, we see that from multiple observational data sets, and we understand why that is. <coughs> we go to the next slide, should be slide three. Um, this is basically that same data set, but shown in a map form. So this is, this is showing actually uh, annual temperature in 2017 relative to the 1950 to 1980 average. So it's the, the difference. And it's just meant to illustrate the fact that that warming that we see, saw in the, in the previous plot, the global mean change, is not uniform across the globe. There are places that are warming more and places that are warming less than the global average. And if you focus your attention on, on North America and Canada in particular, the redder colors indicate more warming in this year relative to the past. And, and that's characteristic of the warming patterns that we see. If we looked at warming in any particular year or averaged over a, a decade or longer, uh, you would see the same sort of pattern, that the warming is larger over land than it is over adjacent ocean, and it is larger over the northern hemisphere high latitudes, so Canada and Eurasia. So that's, the, that's a characteristic of, of the feature of, of, of a warming Earth, and we understand why that is. It has to do with feedbacks in the climate system. But if you look at that figure, you can see that Canada is warming more rapidly than many other parts of the world. If we go to the next slide, slide four, you see that uh, broad needs to more focus. So the two figures on the right-hand side show that the 
mean, the upper one shows the mean annual temperature increase from 1948 to 2016. That was the, the data set that we analyzed for this Canada's Changing Climate Report. It's based on the observational record that we have, and 1948 was chosen as a starting point because that's the, the time frame over which we have sufficient observations in northern Canada to make a meaningful estimate of the temperature there. And what you see is that um, the, the warming is larger, particularly in the Northwest Territories and Yukon. It is the least over the, the Maritimes. The bottom right figure shows that the temperature change in winter, December, January, February, for that same period. And what you see is that the warming is much larger in winter than it is on the annual mean, and therefore the summer warming is less than the annual mean. But winter is the time period in which the warming is most apparent, and the, the pattern is very similar. And I won't read through all the text, but basically the take-home message is that, that over that period, 1948 to 2016, um, Canada has warmed about 1.7 degrees, whereas the global mean temperature over that same period increased about 0.8 degrees. So Canada's warming, on average, about twice as fast as the global average. And if you look at northern Canada in particular, that warming was 3.3 was degrees, which is roughly three times the global average. But it's just like it's not uniform across the globe, it's not uniform across Canada. There are places that have warmed more and warmed less. All right, if we go on to the next slide, uh, slide five, I just want to introduce this concept of, of projections because on the later slides I'm going to talk about uh, future climate change and how do we know about future climate change? Well, we know about that from computer models that are used to, to simulate the climate system. These are complex computer programs that simulate the atmosphere, the ocean, the land surface, the sea ice, the snow, uh, and they allow us to simulate the historical period when we force them with uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases that were observed over the historical period, and they allow us to make projections of the future when we force them with uh, greenhouse gas concentrations of in, in, in a scenario sense. That is, we take a, a scenario of the future, an emission scenario, that's converted into concentrations, and that is, is used to drive these computer models. Because we don't know what future emissions will be. That depends on choices that we make in terms of emission reductions or not. So we can only simulate the response to the future climate uh, to these different emission scenarios. And for most of the results that I'll show, we have selected two emission scenarios, a low emission scenario, which in the, in the literature is referred to as RCP 2.6, and a high emission scenario referred to as RCP 8.5. The RCP numbers don't really matter for the purposes of this presentation, but just to indicate that there is a low emission scenario that is roughly consistent with the Paris Agreement of limiting warming to one and a half or two degrees, and a high emission scenario that is basically no climate policy, uh, basically no no climate policy intervention. So the, the, the temperature change projected for Canada under those two scenarios is shown in this figure. The blue curve shows what would happen under this low emission scenario. We would stabilize at uh, a couple degrees above present. Under the high emission scenario, we would continue to see temperatures increase uh, more than seven degrees or so by the end of this century. So that's just to, to uh, kind of a primer on um, projections. So now if I s go on to the next slide, slide six. And the, the, the next few slides are kind of a combination of observations and projections. Um, as, the, as the climate warms, um, there are lots of implications of that. Uh, so obviously warming involves the temperature increase. But that temperature increase then has, has other effects on the physical climate system. One of those is temperature in the soil. And much of Canada has permafrost, that is permanently frozen water, water that's frozen year-round. And we have been measuring the temperature of that permafrost for a long time in various boreholes. This is part of an observational program that is run by Natural Resources Canada. As, as the temperature changes, lots of other parts of the physical system 
change, and one of the things that changes as the air temperature increases is the soil temperature, and in particular the temperature of permafrost. So permafrost being those areas of, of ground that are below zero all, the, all through the year. The figure on the upper right shows two time series of direct observations of permafrost temperature, one at alert on the very northern tip of, uh, of uh, Ellesmere Island, and uh, I think it's Ellesmere Island, and uh, Norman Wells in the, in the, um, on, on the Yukon, on the uh, McKinsey River. Uh, and these, uh, so what it shows is that the permafrost temperature is increasing as the air temperature is increasing. So that's a natural consequence. As the air warms, then the, the, the soil under <coughs> it uh, warms as well, and that's what, what's observed here. That's also affected by the, the snow cover. The snow tends to insulate the, the soil underneath of it. So we can directly observe that the permafrost is, is warming along with the air. If I go to the next slide, slide 7, we can also look at, at temperature extremes. They're also changing. Uh, so the figure on the left shows the, the changes in the highest daily maximum temperature over the year. The figure on the right shows changes in the, the lowest daily minimum temperature, so the coldest day of the year. So you can think of the left panel showing changes in the hottest day of the year and the, the right figure showing changes in the coldest day of the year. We don't see a, a huge signal in the highest daily maximum temperature, but we do see a very large and uniform change in the, the lowest daily, daily temperature. So the coldest days of the year are becoming less cold virtually everywhere. That also has implications for things like the growing season, uh, which has increased on average about 15 days over the period uh, 1948 to 2016. Uh, if I go on to the next slide, so slide eight, um, as those as the temperature increases and these these there are various extremes. The, the highest and lowest daily temperatures that I just talked about are one measure of of climate extremes, but the, there are changes in uh, heat, the extent and duration of heat waves, changes in the, the extended periods of warm, dry weather that lead to increasing wildfire risk. All of those are projected to increase in the future. Uh, it's hard, harder to uh, discern those changes in the observational record because they are um, uh, less frequent kind of events, but we can, we can see them in uh, the future projections that we have available. Uh, so now I'm on slide nine, uh, changing gears a little bit. As, as the temperature warms, other aspects of the climate system also change, and one of those changes is in precipitation. The, the small panel on the upper right shows the time series of precipitation change over Canada uh, in the observations, and we see that uh, on average precipitation has been increasing over Canada. The figure at the uh, the lower right, uh, kind of middle right, the map, uh, which shows these different colors, that's a, a result of a future projection. And what it shows is under this high emission scenario uh, for the summertime, although on the average uh, precipitation is projected to continue to increase in Canada, uh, in the summertime under this high emission scenario, Although the north is expected to see increased precipitation, areas of southern Canada, particularly the prairies, are projected to see less precipitation. So that combination of less precipitation in summertime and warmer uh, conditions, and therefore more evaporation, will uh, tend towards producing increased water stress in those agricultural regions of southern Canada under a high emission scenario. If I go to the next slide, slide 10, uh, other things related to snow and ice that are changing, we have observed a change in uh, the amount of ice in mountain glaciers and ice caps in Canada, uh, and that's shown in that upper right figure, which is showing a cumulative thickness change, but it shows that for, for the glaciers for which we have uh, long-term observations, the glacier 
thickness and therefore its volume has been decreasing over the observational period and is projected to continue to, to decline in the future. Another natural consequence of, of a warming climate, there's less ice. Uh, that, that also in, involves snow. As the climate warms, the, the projected w uh, warmer temperatures in winter lead to uh, a later onset of snow and an earlier melt of snow, which then combine the earlier um, snow melt um, along with the higher precipitation uh, will produce higher winter stream flows and the lower uh, precipitation in summer and warmer temperatures lead to uh, lower late summer uh, river runoff. So there's again implications for water availability and also springtime flooding. If I go to the next slide, slide 11, uh, as as I'm sure you all are aware, uh, Arctic sea ice has been uh, declining over the period of observation, particularly the period where we have detailed satellite observations from 1979 onward. It's been decreasing at a rate of about 10% per decade. Uh, and when we look into the future, uh, as the sea ice continues to decline under a warming climate, the, the kind of last area that will retain summer sea ice, at least, is in, in northern Canada, the Canadian Arctic Archipelago and north of, of Greenland. But by about mid-century, the projections are that the Canadian Arctic, uh, the, the more southern Canadian Arctic, uh, and much of the Russian Arctic will be ice-free in summer by, by the middle of the century. Uh, there are other implications for the ocean. Uh, as, uh, as the climate warms, the surface of the ocean also warms. It takes up a lot of the heat that is uh, that imbalance in energy that is turned into heat near the surface is taken up by the ocean. The ocean surface warms. That changes the stratification in the ocean, which affects how ocean, uh, how, sorry, how oxygen is, is mixed into the deeper ocean. The other thing is that as carbon dioxide is absorbed by the ocean, about a third of the carbon dioxide that we emit from human activities is taken up by the ocean. And when carbon dioxide is dissolved in ocean water, it, it produces uh, acid, carbonic acid. So the, the ocean, as it absorbs carbon dioxide, becomes slightly more and more acidic. And that has implications for shellfish and and other creatures in the ocean that, that make use of calcium carbonate for their um, body structures, their shells, and so on. And so that increasing acidity is a, is a threat to the health of marine ecosystems. Another uh, implication of a warming climate for the ocean is sea level change. Uh, sea level on a global scale uh, changes from, from two main uh, causes. One is as the ocean water warms up, it's taking up heat, the ocean temperature increases. As the ocean temperature increases, it expands, and that increasing volume of ocean water results in the global ocean surface rising up. So it's, it's uh, increasing in volume, and that leads to a, to a widespread sea level increase. The other uh, source is melting of ice that is currently stored on land. So mountain glaciers and the large ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica, which are both losing losing ice as well. As the climate warms, that oh, ice is now joining. Um, leave the land and flow into the ocean and adds volume to the ocean, also leading to sea level rise. Now, like temperature, sea level rise is not uniform. Uh, there, you can calculate the global amount of sea level rise, but what you actually experience at a coastline is the difference between that the rising sea level and the motion of the land, because the land is also not um, not constant in its height. Um, much of the the land, particularly in Canada, is still rebounding from the last large ice age, where we had very thick ice sheet that covered most of Canada. And when that ice sheet left about 12,000 years ago, the mm -hmm. land then uh, rebounds and is, is rising. And so the next slide, slide 14, shows the change, the projected change in relative sea level, which is what you actually experience. So that's the difference between the 
the sea level rising and the land moving. And in many places, the land is moving up at a rate that is faster than the sea level is moving up. And that's shown in the, the green and purple curve. So much of Hudson's Bay and the Canadian Arctic archipelago, the kind of center of the large ice sheet during the last ice age, that's where the rebound is, is most rapid and the land is actually rising faster than sea level. And what you experience there is, is actually sea level fall. But on in the Maritimes and along the coast of, of British Columbia, the land is, is not rising faster than the, the ocean is rising. And so we will experience ongoing uh, change in or increase in sea level, which has implications for coastal infrastructure, for coastal flooding, and, and so on. I have two slides here that talk a little bit about impacts. Uh, most of you know my work is really on the changes in physical climate, not so much on the impacts of those changes in physical climate, but I'll just say a few words. Uh, as, as the climate changes, there are implications for things like water quality. Uh, that has to do with uh, the changes in the seasonality of, of runoff, the temperature of the water, uh, the amount of um, sediment and nutrients in the water. Those, those all affect uh, water quality in addition to water quantity. The similar effects in, in large lakes where warming and increased nutrient availability is leading to, to algal blooms and hypoxia. Uh, slide 16, uh, another consequence of a changing climate is the ability for certain species to uh, survive in places that they historically couldn't. And so we're, we're seeing uh, species of, of, of various things, birds and fish and other critters, insects and so on, that, uh, that are now able to survive in places that they historically couldn't. And, and some of them bring with them uh, negative consequences, like uh, uh, diseases that are spread by, by birds and insects, uh, pests that affect um, forest productivity, like the mountain pine beetle, uh, and, and uh, marine uh, species that affect uh, and compete with uh, native species in, in lakes and rivers and so on. All right, so the last uh, couple slides that I'll show, uh, I was asked to say a little bit about uh, two degrees warming versus one and a half degrees warming. So if I'm, I'm now on slide 17. There isn't a huge amount of work that's been done specifically for Canada on uh, the differences between two and one and a half. Most of the work that's been done looks at a low scenario and a much higher scenario, as I described near the beginning of this talk. But uh, I'll just look, show a, a couple slides here. These come from this IPCC special report on, on 1.5 degrees, where there was, at a large scale, some uh, uh, analysis of the difference between two and one and a half degrees. But what this this is a very busy figure, and I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it is showing uh, on the, the column of figures on the extreme left is showing the, the, uh, uh, the upper part, the change in the temperature of the hottest day. So it's the same sort of thing that I showed before, the, the, the hottest day of the year. The middle one shows the change in the coldest night, uh, and then the bottom one is showing a change in extreme precipitation. The first column, those three on the left, are for one and a half degrees. The middle column is for two degrees. So you see those figures look very much the same, but they are the colors are more intense in the two degree uh, version of the figure, indicating a bigger change in the in these quantities: uh, extreme hot, uh, cold, and extreme precipitation under the two scenarios. And the last column shows the difference between the two. And I'll just draw your attention to the fact that the, just as the, in the figure I showed earlier on for Canada, the difference in the hottest days is not that large, but the difference in the coldest uh, temperature, the particular coldest nighttime temperature, is quite large. So there is a big difference uh, even between this rather subtle uh, one and a half to two degree global temp change on uh, the implications for nighttime cold temperatures. Differences in precipitation uh, shown in the bottom left are, are pretty modest over most of, of Canada. They are larger in the tropics. Uh, slide 18, 
is is kind of a summary uh, that was made in that special report on 1.5 showing the the risks or reasons for concern, the changing risk of, of these different reasons for concern. The reasons for concern are, are listed across the bottom. Uh, the first uh, a little uh, symbol shows the, the risk for unique and threatened ecosystems, or uh, the second one shows the risk of extreme weather events, the third one is the risk of uh, distributed impacts, and so on. And this, the, the way this figure is meant to be read is kind of like a, a, a thermometer that is the yellow colors indicate moderate risk, the red colors indicate high risk, the purple colors indicate a very high risk. And the temperature scale, which is probably a little bit hard to see for you, goes from zero at the very bottom to one, one and a half, and two. And I've highlighted one and a half and two degrees. And so you can see for all of these quantities, there is a change in risk, as you would expect, going from one and a half to two degrees. Uh, and that risk continues to increase as the, as the climate warms beyond that. Now, you could imagine that for many of these things, the, there's a similar, uh, at least conceptually, a similar kind of response for, for these kind of um, risks in Canada, but I, I'm not aware that anyone has really analyzed them at that level of detail. Uh, the, the last couple of slides are really uh, kind of an a, attempt to, to make a, a segue, and I think when Chris talks later, he's going to pick up on this in much more detail. But uh, just to, to come back to the question of the, the reasons that the climate is changing and, and how it will change in the future, it's, it's very clear that the warming that we have observed is primarily a consequence of increased concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, primarily carbon dioxide, which is the, the biggest uh, human-caused uh, greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And, and it, interestingly, there is a very close connection between the cumulative amount of carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere and the temperature change that uh, it accompanies that. And that's what's illustrated on that rather busy figure on the left. The, the, you know, I'm not going to get into the, the details of that figure, but the, the point is that there is this kind of linear relationship between cumulative total human emissions across the, the horizontal axis and global temperature change on the vertical axis. And so what that implies is that to, to have uh, to have temperature well you can you can view it either way when you put a certain amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that will lead to a certain temperature change if you put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere it will lead to a larger temperature change you can also read it in the other way and ask if i want to limit uh, temperature change to one and a half degrees. You can read across and then read down the way those blue arrows are indicated, and that will tell you the total amount of carbon dioxide that you can put into the atmosphere and still limit temperature to that value. If you want to limit temperature to two degrees, you read across and read down, and that will give you the total amount of carbon dioxide that you can emit and still keep temperature at two degrees. There is, of course, some uncertainty associated with that. That is the, the concept that underlies this idea of a, a carbon budget. That is, there's only a certain amount of carbon dioxide that you can put into the atmosphere if you want to limit um, uh, temperature to a certain value. It also is the basis for the, the fact that you can't, ex you know, once you've reached that carbon budget, you can't emit any more, otherwise you will continue to warm. So if you want temperature to, to stabilize at some value, you ultimately have to get emissions to zero so that you don't continue to add to this cumulative total. The, the figure on the right is, uh, I'm not going to go into, but it's just a, an illustration, again, from, a, from a, a, a modeling result that shows that carbon dioxide has a very long lifetime in the atmosphere, and that's, that's why this, this carbon budget concept arises that once you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it stays there for, for many decades, even centuries, and its effect remains in place for a very long time. So those, those curves there show different scenarios in which you increase carbon dioxide and then suddenly zero them, and the temperature remains 
basically the same for centuries into the future. We, the, the implication there is that the amount of carbon dioxide you put into the atmosphere effectively locks in a temperature change, and it's basically irreversible on, on kind of relevant human time scales unless you actively extract carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere. So the last, uh, almost last slide, uh, slide 20, uh, shows the emission pathways that, uh, that have been analyzed in, in past IPCC reports, including this special report on, on 1.5. So there's time going across the horizontal axis and, and uh, CO2 emissions, annual CO2 emissions on the, the vertical axis. And the, the blue curve at the bottom is this very ambitious low emission pathway that would keep warming to well below two degrees, basically the Paris Agreement target. And the, the black dots are the observed historical emissions, so you can see where we, we are and the, the trajectory that we're currently on. If we want to limit warming to, to well below two degrees, then we, our emissions would have to follow that blue path, which is basically that they peak basically now, and then begin to reduce rapidly, getting to, to zero by around the middle of the century. If we don't meet that emission pathway, the, the next one up, the yellow pathway, is a, is a less ambitious pathway, which would lead to warming in the, in the two to three degree range. Uh, the next pathway up is, is that sort of black one that would lead to warming in the two to four degree range, and the, the red, one up at the top is this essentially no climate policy um, uh, pathway that would lead to, to much higher warming by the end of the century. The current commitments uh, under the Paris Agreement would lead to about three degrees by 2100. Uh, so if we are to meet the Paris Agreement target, there are still uh, much more ambitious emission reductions that would be required. Uh, slide. 21 is uh, just to, to kind of summarize that. The Paris Agreement, as you know, is to, is to limit global warming to well below two degrees and aim for one and a half. The figure shows where we have been, that is the observed warming in blue up to more or less the present. The dotted line is a, an extrapolation of the current warming rate. If we continue to warm at the rate we have been over the last several decades, we will hit that one and a half degree um, level by around 2040 and, and shoot past it. If we want to limit warming to one and a half degrees, we would have to follow some temperature pathway that's in that, that green shaded area, and that would, that would imply uh, getting towards net zero emissions uh, by the middle of the century. And the, the last slide is slide 22, and just to, to summarize by indicating that there are, there are very different possible futures for Canada. The two figures at the bottom show uh, the warming level for Canada, annual mean warming by the end of the century, under this low emission scenario that would lead to uh, <laughs> degree warming, and under a very high emission scenario that would lead to more than six degree warming. The difference between those er two scenarios and the, therefore the two future climate possibilities is what we do in terms of reducing emissions between now and, and the middle of the century. And that's uh, where I will leave it, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Greg. And questions? Greg, yeah, I might have missed this in your presentation. I apologize if, if I have, but <clears throat> we saw a lot there that we're seeing a, a, a big warming, uh, particularly in the winter. And you said in one of the slides, we understand why that is. Can you expand a little bit on that? Like, why is it that it's happening in the winter? Uh, and, and what are some of the factors that, that make that more prevalent in Canada compared to other places? Yeah, uh, so. Part of it, there, there's there's a, a few reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is is directly associated with the the way that carbon dioxide warms the the planet, uh, and that 
the effect is is I mean to, to put it in simple terms that effect is, is more um, uh, more it's more effective in the winter let me put it that way uh, the other thing is there are there are feedbacks in the in the system that involve uh, particularly uh, snow on the on the ground and so you is now exiting if you uh, reduce the amount of snow, uh, the the darker vegetation and land underneath is exposed. That absorbs solar radiation. So this is more in the shoulder seasons of, of spring and, and fall or kind of early winter and late winter. Uh, that warms the surface and reduces the, 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 the snow cover further. That has a, a, a positive uh, warming effect that amplifies the initial warming, and that that has a tendency to to shorten the snow covered season and and on average uh, lead to a warmer uh, uh, a warmer period. So it's it's a it's a combination of of factors, um, and I'm sorry it's kind of hard for me to to explain that sitting here and talking into the phone. I think that's helpful. I, I, I understand. I think we can understand the idea of the snow reflects heat and darker surface absorb it. The CO2, right? That, that one's probably a little bit. <laughs> that might need a little bit more uh, uh, discussion to figure that one out a little bit. But I think that, that the surfaces helps a lot. Um, thanks for the great presentation, Greg. You know, there's there's a lot of talk and discussion about the RCP 8.5 and whether that's um, whether that's real or whether that's just some, you know, figment of some completely implausible scenario. I just wonder if you had any thoughts or any um, things you want to say about about kind of where you think we're at, we're we're truly at on these on these different scenarios. Yeah. So there has been lots of discussion on on uh, social media about RCP 8.5 and and whether it's it, it's even a plausible scenario. Um, I think that that whole discussion, it, it, to me, sort of misses the the point in that these are they're all scenarios. So there is a whole range of these scenarios. Uh, these they're they're labeled in in different ways. The the IPCC has primarily made use of of uh, a set of four of these scenarios. And in the in Canada's Changing Climate Report, we uh, we primarily used the two, the the lowest and the highest. Um, they are kind of indicative scenarios, and by construction, they were intended to be indicative scenarios. They weren't intended to represent a particular uh, pathway along which, uh, you know, regulations and technology and so on would 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 follow, but rather to provide a set of representative emission scenarios that could be used to explore how the climate might change in the future and how sensitive that change is to, to the different emission scenarios. On, guess, so RCP 8.5 is indeed a, an extreme scenario in this that it involves uh, a lot of uh, fossil fuel consumption, a lot of coal consumption, and there are questions of whether that's uh, even uh, you know, a, a plausible scenario. It becomes it, it, there. The the difficulty is that, of course, climate policies have been enacted over the last couple of decades that have led to a reduction in the intensity of fossil fuel usage, that have led to uh, less greenhouse gas intensive energy production, the deployment of more renewable energy, and so on, and and so that very extreme high emission scenario becomes less and less plausible just by virtue of the fact that policies are changing and, and the world is changing. That's sort of as it should be. That doesn't, in my mind, doesn't undermine the value of looking at at a, at kind of bounding scenarios. In the same way that the low scenario, RCP 2.6, and, and in the current IPCC assessment, there's an even lower uh, scenario uh, that's basically a, a 1.7 scenario. Um, those scenarios are, are extremely ambitious in terms of their mitigation reductions, their deployment of renewables, their uh, use of carbon capture and storage. Whether those are, are plausible or realistic is also 
a question. But I think, again, it's, it's useful to look at a range of scenarios and ask, how would the climate change under these different scenarios and use that to inform policy decisions uh, aiming at, at reducing the negative consequences of, of climate change. So I, I, I view them as, as useful guidance and I don't think anyone ever really intended for them to, to be uh, you know, a, a kind of certainly not a, a prediction of, of the future. One question, and you only kind of touched on this with talking about the uh, fundamental rebound from the last ice age or the most recent ice age. But I'm just curious if there's uh, research being done. Yeah, yeah, you, you're, you're kind of breaking up, and, and I'm, I'm only catching every second word. Sorry, I'll speak a little louder. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so I guess my question is about you touched on a little bit about like the isostatic rebound of the continents after the uh, most recent ice age. Yeah. Is there anything in the climate modeling or looking at that, at whether or not the carbon melt in the atmosphere was involved in the warming of the planet after the ice age or the cause of the ice age? Or is that being used to other natural factors? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I, I caught 100% of that, but I, I think the question, you know, as I understood it, was is there is there research that clarifies the causes of the ice age and the interglacial periods between ice ages? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah. And if everybody that's on the phone, please put your phones on mute uh, unless you're speaking. Thanks. And I think specific to the carbon balance in the atmosphere, I guess, is the question, because I know there's lots of intera other interactions, but I'm just curious on that. Yeah, so I mean, it, it is, we do have a, a, a good understanding of the, the cause of the, of the glacial cycles, the, the long-term changes that lead to ice ages punctuated by these interglacial warmer periods. That has to do with changes in the way that the Earth orbits the sun. That orbit uh, is variable. The ellipticity of the orbit changes, the tilt of Earth's axis changes on, on these kind of 10,000 and 100,000 year time scales. And that leads to the, the coming and going of these ice ages. There are feedbacks in the climate system that lead to changes in the carbon cycle and the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in response to those uh, changing, to those uh, externally forced, orbitally forced changes in climate. So that illustrates very clearly that the carbon cycle and the physical climate system are very closely intertwined. But the, it, there's a difference in, in terms of cause and effect. In, on the glacial to interglacial time scale, it is the physical climate that is changing in response to changing orbital um, features that leads to changes in the carbon cycle, whereas over the recent historical period, over the, the last um, century and a half, it's the other way around. That is, changes in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere due to human emissions is changing the physical system. So they are they're intimately intertwined, but the, the direction of cause and effect <coughs> is different over the recent century than it was over the the glacial, the slow glacial to interglacial time period. I, ho I hope I've answered the, uh, actually answered the question there. Greg, thank you for your presentation. I watch a lot of TV and especially this <coughs> and everybody's focusing on climate change. And I watch the scientists around the world talking about everything under the sun, like uh, the volcanoes that are happening in the oceans and on land. And the other one was really interesting about um, from that telescope that they have in space that our Earth is tilting two degrees or something like that. And the places that are usually cold are warming up. They're moving into a warmer thing. You got any views on that? Um, yeah, so two two separate things. So one is uh, the, the role of volcanoes in climate. Um, volcanoes, particularly the, the explosive uh, large volcanoes like Pinatubo, for example, in the, in the early 1990s, uh, 
those volcanoes that that are that inject a lot of ash and um, sulfur sulfur dioxide other sulfur bearing compounds th up into the stratosphere that is the level of the atmosphere above about 40 50,000 feet kind of the, the 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 lower part of the stratosphere is where jet airplanes fly in so that that upper layer of the atmosphere when ash and sulfur and other things are injected into the into the stratosphere they linger there for a long time several years and that material uh, reflects solar radiation so the sunlight coming from the sun is reflected back from these little particles that are injected from from aerosol uh, from from volcanic uh, explosive volcanic eruptions into the stratosphere sunlight is reflected back into space and that has a cooling effect on climate so these large uh, explosive volcanoes have a, a a cooling effect on climate that lasts for a couple years after the the eruption and you can see that in the historical record record after these large eruptions and the Pinatubo one is is the one that has been studied the most because of course we had lots of um, observations on that but there have been a number of large uh, uh, explosive volcanic eruptions over the historical period and that is included in these climate uh, models that the forcing from those uh, volcanic eruptions is included and is is the the cooling the short-lived cooling after those eruptions is simulated by climate models we have no ability to predict future volcanic uh, eruptions and so that's not included in future climate projections because there is no currently available method of, of uh, predicting when or how strong uh, volcanic emission or, uh, eruption will, will be. So volcanoes do affect climate. They are included in the historical simulation and they have a, a cooling effect. Uh, there, there is some confusion about the, uh, the tilt of the Earth's axis. So the, the Earth rotates around the, an axis, which is the North Pole. Uh, that n rotational axis moves slightly from year to year, uh, and that is in response to changes in the distribution of, of mass on the planet, mostly to do with, with uh, groundwater. So as certain areas of the, of the land dry out or get more wet, so extended periods of drought or extended periods of you know, rainfall, uh, water accumulates in the soil and makes the, that part of the land heavier than it would usually be if it's wet or lighter than it would usually be if it's dry. The, the changing ice sheets also have an effect on the distribution of mass on the planet, but they're near the poles, and so Greenland and Antarctica, although they're losing mass, they don't have as much of an effect. It turns out that that change in mass, which seems like a kind of esoteric thing, does affect the way that the planet rotates around its axis and so the the north pole the axis the north and the south pole but the north, the axis about which the planet rotates wiggles around but that wiggling around is is and it has been observed for um, for more than a century there are very careful astronomical observations that allow you to to measure that and monitor that but it 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 wobbles only around by a, a few meters. So it's if you were to to draw a spot uh, up in the Arctic where that rotational axis is and trace it from year to year, it would move around by a few meters here and there. So you could you know cover that that patch around it which it's wobbling in, in the room you're sitting. It's undetectable to the human eye. It's undetectable. It, it has no effect on climate or, or weather. It's only detectable by very careful astronomical observations. So there is some misunderstanding as to whether that wobbling has any effect on climate, and it, and it does not. It's the long time scale wobble on the, the tens of thousands of year time scale where the, the whole the axis relative to the orbital plane in the solar system that changes on a very slow you know 10,000 of years time scale and that has an effect on the comings and goings of ice ages but that's a a totally different um mechanism <laughs>